Ontario's provincial deficit came in $1.2 billion lower than forecast for the last fiscal year. That's 2013-14. While that might look like good news, the province used a billion dollars from its reserve fund to help it achieve that target. And with revenues down and a slower than expected global economic recovery, it might be a tough climb back into the black by 2017-18. That's the year the Liberals have promised to balance the books. Let's pour over these numbers with Avery Schenfeld. He's chief economist with CIBC World Markets and Martin Redcon, Ontario politics columnist at the Toronto Star. And thank you, gentlemen, for making the drive to Leaside to be with us here tonight. Let us, at the risk of inundating you with numbers you already know, we'll share a few here. Uh, here's the 2013-14 actual results against the 2013 budget plan. In other words, what they planned and what really happened. Revenues. Okay, this is everything from tax income, everything like that. Almost $116 billion, but expenditures significantly higher, $126 plus billion. The projected deficit, once upon a time, was $11.7 billion. They took a billion out of the reserve fund, and the actual deficit turned $10.5 billion, turned out to be $10.5 billion. And I want, uh, Avery, as you look at those numbers, to give us your sense about what they say about the state of the province's finances. Well, what they say is the province did a pretty good job at the end of the year pinching pennies. So they actually brought spending in a little lower than they expected. Uh, but at the end of the day, it also tells us that with the economy growing slowly, you don't really make much progress on deficits. In fact, if you go back, although they've beaten the target, actually the target was higher than the previous year's deficit. So we really didn't make any progress. If you look at the plan for the coming year, the plan is actually a $12.5 billion deficit. So higher. They, higher still. Now, if we beat the plan, which I think we will, we won't see that increase in the deficit. But the bottom line here is when the economy is not growing quickly and the revenues are not rolling in, even with discipline on spending, it's a pretty tough road to hoe. So we need both economic growth to pick up, which I think is about to happen. So I think that's good news. And we also need a several-year plan of very tight spending management. Martin, as you look at it, let me get you to gauge the sort of financial target from the political target. These targets for balancing the budget, uh, the budget and, and how big the deficit is going to be, are they more financial or are they more political? Well, it almost seems like a game of whack-a-mole. You, you make these projections and then you always come in under. So they tend to under-promise and over perform and that's a good thing you so for five consecutive years they've beat their targets that's better than coming in the other way around as the federal government did they promised to balance the budget this year and had to push that back a year because they had over promised uh, there seems there tends to be a lot of, of skepticism about these projections people think the government is 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 kind of goosing the numbers to make themselves look good I don't really know what happens in that black box but my impression is that they tend to follow more or less consensus forecasts among the private sector economists mm -hmm. and and don't ten, and they tend, to, they tend to scale it back a little bit so that they don't get caught out but if, if the question is is there a big game going on here to always make themselves look good as tempting a conclusion as that is i think that's that tends to be the pattern notwithstanding the fact that as we've pointed out the economy has significantly underperformed and that's not a question of the government overestimating it again the private sector forecasts for the last three or four years have significantly overestimated how the economy would do. But it wasn't so much projecting how the Ontario economy would do. It was the American economy that surprised everybody by coming in under year after year. So would you say that the targets that they have laid out for deficit reduction have not been terribly ambitious? Is that a nice way to put it? I think they would say that, in fact, they have decided that as till the economy shows a bit more momentum, they don't want to whack it with anything too severe, lest that hamper growth. So I think there was a recognition here, because we've seen it certainly if you want to take a case in point, look what's happened in Europe. Try to get the deficit down at a time when you're not getting economic growth and you get even less economic growth. So it can be self-defeating. So what they've given themselves is a bit of elbow room to say, we'll, we'll have this target several years out for a balanced budget. We're just gonna stay with that target, but we are going to pace ourselves towards that target conditional on how the economy grows. This has been a slow recovery for Ontario. Uh, Ontario has run below the national average now, not only since the recession, but in fact prior to the recession. And, and as was said, it also ran a bit below 
multi-year mm -hmm. projections that were made by the private sector. Do bankers, though, when they look at these deficit targets and they make these big announcements saying, hey, we beat the target by $1.2 billion. Okay, we used a billion from our contingency fund. Is that cheating, sort of? Well, the contingency fund, they didn't actually use it. In fact, it's almost the opposite. They didn't have to use it. So the contingency fund is built in there to say, we actually think that if everything goes right, the deficit will be this. But we're going to add a billion to that for margin of error in these forecasts, which often go awry. So in fact, the way I would put it at the top of the show is, Ontario didn't have to use its billion dollar contingency because it kept spending uh, in line. In fact, it came in under its target so for program do, spending. So what they do with that billion dollars? Well, it just disappears. It was never, it was a spending that they didn't have to do. And in fact, it's extra spending that will be, or loss of revenue that would result from an underperforming economy. Oh, and they have it built into the next couple of years. So in effect, if the economy actually matches forecasts, they save a billion dollars in the current year and the next year. If it beats the forecast, you could be looking potentially at a couple billion dollars of elbow room here. And, and there tends to be a, a great deal of skepticism and, and uh, cynicism about these so-called reserves. And they're not, as far as I understand it, actual reserve funds. They're not sort of segregated amounts of money. It's more of a paper margin of error. And so, in mm -hmm. fact, if we not only leave that contingency untouched, over the next couple of years, you could have a surplus in theory. So it's not as if that money stays in a fund. It's, it's just... Um, it's a way of, of building yourself some elbow room so that if, if, for example, revenues come in below, you're not going to be that much more in the red. You have that much cushion in your, in your mm -hmm. estimates. But in terms of the ambition question that you asked on the deficit, I think it was ambitious, but I, but I, think, I think necessity is the mother of ambition here. I think they, they were, had such a significant deficit going back to roughly 2010, I guess it was, $17 billion, mm -hmm. they had to bring that down. And even though there were many good reasons for going that high over because of 2008, uh, the economic downturn and having to stimulate the economy, they needed to reassure investors, credit rating agencies, even though I'm not big fans of those rating, rating agencies, that they had a plan to bring it down. So they set that target. They didn't really have a plan. They just mm -hmm. created a line. They said, we're, we're over here at $17 billion. We're going to be at zero in 2017. And they drew a straight line without really having any idea of how to achieve that back in 2010. It hasn't I, been that straight a line, though. That line has well, gone like It's this, gone up and down, right? but yeah. it's gone more down than up, in fact. <laughs> so it, when, it, when it goes up, it's because it's going back to that imaginary straight line. Hmm. But they've come in under, and they, I think they do have something more of a plan. It's not a complete plan for the back end years, but they have been able to bring down spending. They've been able to, to bend that cost curve. It's a cliche that everyone uses mm -hmm. in the bureaucracy. It's an elegant turn of phrase. But they have brought spending down from about 5% a year growth over the previous decade, 5% every year, to about 1% to 2% over the last two or three years, every year. I'd like to get your impression on, and I'm going to overly simplify this, and then you'll obviously put some flesh on the bone here. As far as I understand it, there's really only two ways to balance a budget. You've got to raise revenues, however you want to do that, or you got a lower spending or a combination of both. This government has made some decisions about where to find that balance. What do you think about where they've found the balance? Well, where they've found the balance is a bit of both. Spending actually is not as profligate as you might think. So if you actually look at Ontario and you say, well, how do we stack up relative to other provinces in terms of per capita program spending? We're actually generally the cheapest. And as we spend the they least. They say that. So that's I really think that's true. That's absolutely eh? true. They say we're, we're we the don't lowest spend a lot. per capita program spending in the country is what they say. Absolutely well, true. It's helped by the fact that we have a very we have a big population. We have scale so, economies yeah, to yeah. some extent, but, but they're not particularly profligate. If you look at revenues, again, they're sort of in the middle of the pack on some of these revenue sources. So we're starting from a point where the easy fruit on spending has been picked. It's not going to be as easy, for example, in the last two years or three years of their plan. They actually have no growth in program spending. If you strip out interest payments, program spending is going to be flat. That means nothing to cover inflation, nothing to cover population growth. So that's a very ambitious spending plan. Actually, some big decreases in some ministries. There has to be a big yeah. de decrease in some ministries if health, for example, still grows. Mm -hmm. I think what may end up happening is they do a little bit better on the revenue side than they expect. So the economy is showing some signs of actually gaining momentum. It's not something you really cheer about you know, wholeheartedly, but Ontario is now looking more like an average province as opposed to it's been for a long time now a below average province in terms of economic growth. And they budgeted for a being a below average province. So actually, they're going to get some extra revenue there. 
And of course, they're looking at some other potential revenue sources beyond what they've done, whether it's asset sales, where they can get a little more money coming in. And they could potentially look at things that other provinces have done. So if you looked at Nova Scotia, when the federal government cut its sales tax, Nova Scotia said, thank you very much, we're raising ours. Hmm. And a point on the, uh, the sales tax, for example, is worth $2 billion. Would you do that? If you were treasurer, would you, let's just explain that. The, the federal government cut its portion of the harmonized sales tax. It was still the GST at the time, by two points. In other words, Ontario could have moved in, added two points to the tax. It would have been a wash. Nobody would have seen any difference. And Ontario would have realized more revenue. Is that something they should have done? Well, I might have done it. Or I think more importantly, as we look ahead, with the economy is doing well enough to absorb a hit like that, because again, that does cut into people's spending power and economic growth, mm -hmm. that may be one option at least worth looking at. In general, remember that the federal government, has, you know, maybe this year and certainly next year, will be starting to run surpluses and is promising to actually reduce Canadians' tax burdens. And I think what we are going to see, not, not particularly for Ontario, but in general among the provinces in the next decade is, they've got the spending items that the public wants more of. The public wants more, better health care, more roads, more subways, and so on. Right. What we may see is a shift of taxing, where the federal government taxes less and provinces tax use more. that room to tax That's more. That's where I want to bring Martin back in, because again, in this kind of where you find the balance between raising revenues and cutting spending, the government is increasing taxes. They did announce in their last budget, higher income people are going to pay more in tax, etc. Should they have done more? Well, first of all, they did it during, in a minority government environment where both the Tories and New Democrats were holding the line on that and, and, and opposing tax increase, increases. So uh, taxing the rich, which is what they opted to do, and aviation tax increases, which mm -hmm. nobody really sees in a big way, they were able to get away with. Will they do it going forward? I think there's a great hesitation to touch the HST. I think you're right that the time to, or it was an opportunity, but it's, I think that opportunity has passed when the, when, the, when the federal government gave them, foolishly in my view, gave them this extra room of two points to move in. Mm -hmm. That was the time to do it. But I think it would now be seen as too much of a tax grab for, for the government. Manitoba did that. They raised the, their, their provincial sales tax by a point and have taken some heat for it. They didn't harmonize the tax as we have in Ontario, and we mm -hmm. took heat for it, the government that is. So um, I, I think tax increases are always going to be on the table. There are many in the Liberal caucus who would like to spend more, uh, raise more on taxes. Uh, at the end of the day, though, it's always, I think, the economic growth that is the engine. I mean, this government was able to, to generate far higher revenues in the la earlier part of this past decade without raising, having to raise the tax rate just because the engine of the economy helped them along. And all indications are, finally, Despite having said this in the year, the year before and the year before that, it does seem as if next year is the, the promised land. Hmm. And it is going to go up quite, a, and it's going to go just above the national average, in fact, in Ontario, if these guys are right. I do want to quote two federal politicians and then get your take on how that affects potentially the, the provincial scene. Justin Trudeau once said his choice for balancing the budget would be to grow our way out of it, make sure the economy grows at such a good rate that the revenues start flowing in and that way you don't have to cut spending too much and you can balance that way. And he was widely ridiculed by the Conservatives for saying that. Until Joe Oliver said it last night. The Federal Finance Minister said the exact same thing last night. He wants to grow our way out of anyway. Is that the way to do it? So I think what Joe Oliver was referring to, to get it right down, is that if you're talking about the level of debt relative to GDP, there's a choice between do we need to actually start paying off debt, like running surpluses for several years, which we did, remember, in the 90s when we had really high debt burden at the federal level, or is it good enough at the federal level now to run balanced budgets, which would still reduce the debt as a share of GDP because GDP would grow? And Joe Oliver's point was, I think his point was, the debt is not so high at the federal level, we can afford to do that. That's 500 um, billion plus, right? Yes, but as a share of GDP relative to other countries, actually our federal debt looks just fine, which is why we're a triple A rated country. Okay. Ontario's debt is actually second highest among the provinces as a share of GDP to Quebec. So there's a little more urgency there to get it down. But ultimately, I doubt we will run large surpluses to do that. I think in the reality is no matter which party's in power, there's enough pressure to spend that we're going to take the route of trying to run balanced budgets down the road and have the economy grow to reduce that debt burden. In fact, even a slight deficit would still reduce the burden to GDP. Mm -hmm. what, what we're saying, though, is that in the near term, 
the cheaper Canadian dollar is starting to help manufacturers. We may get a bit more of that next year. And the better U.S. economy is helping Ontario. We're the most levered to the U.S. economy. So some of the better news we're seeing on the U.S. economy is now, I think, brightening the outlook for the economy to generate some additional revenues finally for the Ontario government to, to play with. Still a very tight line on spending, uh, don't get me wrong, it's not an easy road from here to a balanced budget uh, you know, on their target. And everyone wants a balanced budget because you don't want to dig yourself further into the red. But getting rid of the debt is another question entirely and it's not really completely analogous to household debt. I have debt because I have a mortgage so I don't aspire to be debt free tomorrow because I have assets that I can bank on. Ontario's debt is an uncomfortable $300 billion, so it's not that much less than, than the federal debt, although we are 40% of the economy. But uh, in terms of, the, of, of that debt as a, as a percentage of the overall economy in this province, it's, it's at about f just under 40% now, a little lower than people had thought it might be by now. Quebec says at about 50%, which is generally seen to be too, too high for that province. Traditionally in Ontario, it was at about 27%, and the government has identified that as a target. So that is also a target we're trying to aim at. And again, as the economy gets bigger, if that debt can be kept, un kept under control, it will shrink as a percentage of the economy. What's the sweet number? I mean, we've, uh, it, Martin, Martin said accurately that they have identified whatever it is, high 30s percent debt to GDP is too high. It used to be high 20s, and that was somehow okay. What's the right number? You know, there's no economic science in this. It's not like there's a, uh, a magic number. Obviously, from the federal government's point of view and from the province's point of view, what you're really concerned about is how much of the tax revenue that you take in has to go to pay interest payments. And when does that get too onerous? Right now, we seem to be in an era of relatively low interest rates. And therefore, the burden on taxpayers to pay these interest payments is not particularly high as a share of revenue. So we can afford to actually have a bit of a higher debt than perhaps we did in some past decades when, remember, interest rates were in double-digit levels. Right. Yeah. So it's really all about when do you reach the point where you're squeezing programs in order to pay the interest bill. It's not that severe uh, yet in Ontario because interest rates are low. The province has actually been locking in a lot of its debt, 30-year bonds and so on. So we've locked in these low interest rates for quite a lot of the debt. So that's good. Uh, which is a good thing. And it gives us, therefore, some time. But I think what we do know is that the endless parade of higher debt at some point does squeeze programs. You can reach the point where if 10 years from now interest rates balloon for some reason, then suddenly you'll find yourselves in a very uncomfortable position that we want to avoid. Mm -hmm. Can I disagree with our fiscally prudent <laughs> bank economists for one moment? So it's true that I will, I will acknowledge that, that Ontario's, um, the tall foreheads in our, in our treasury building have in fact locked in much of our debt for long term, low rates on long term, so, so good on them. But even so, debt still gets turned over and interest rates, bless you, have been low for the last few years. But when they go up, they can go up quickly. And I do remember when interest rates were 19, 20% uh, in the early 1980s. And in the mid 1980s, I remember Brian Mulroney talking about how roughly one third of every tax dollar federally went to service our federal debt. So it can, it can really steamroller out of control. And, and yes, it, right now in Ontario, it's only about one-tenth of our revenues, of our tax revenues, a little less than one-tenth, go into servicing that debt. But it's going to go from about $10 billion a year to about 12 or $14 billion a year, if I'm not mistaken, by 27, eight, eight, It's the third highest expenditure item in the budget. That's right, after education and health care. So Interest on the debt, yeah. big time. Let me ask you while you have the floor here about a fairly controversial idea the government has little controversial at this stage, once they actually get some real recommendations coming forward, might be more so. They've got one of your former competitors, right? Ed Clark, former uh, chairman of TD, to uh, head up a blue ribbon panel looking at various government agencies, boards, commissions, uh, assets that the government potentially could sell to apply to the bottom line. What are you hearing about what they're looking at and what makes sense to do here? I sat down with Ed Clark last week, but he didn't tell me anything. <laughs> but what I am hearing from others is that they are, they're looking really, their assignment is to look at the three big, what I used to call crown corporations, the government business enterprises, I think we call them now. So that's uh, OPG, Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and LCBO, and maybe the beer store if we can shoehorn that in. <laughs> and 
Do I think they're going to sell them off in whole or in part? Personally, I don't. I think Hydro One, there's room to, con which is the transmission sector, mm -hmm. there's room to consolidate that because you have all these small uh, local distribution companies that, are, that, don't, that lack scale. But in terms of the sexy one that people wonder about, the LCBO, I think the government has already telegraphed that they're not going to sell that off holus bolus. They make too much money out of that and they, get a, they benefit from having this big monopoly uh, instead of atomizing it or privatizing it. OPG is already contracting as the nuclear sector gets less and less of the power generation in this province and as the private sector at Bruce Nuclear gets a bigger share as well. What I think we're going to see, rather, since there's not that much to sell off in either of those, what I think we're going to see is more of what our base three friends will call sweating the, the balance sheets, I think, and trying to extract more revenue, more profit out of ongoing operations. So at the LCBO, some people think there is a couple of hundred million dollars, two to three hundred million they could extract from more efficient taxation, different job classifications, uh, selling more beer from that beer monopoly that we've mm -hmm. spoken about earlier. And equally at OPG, they had some crazy pension arrangements that they're trying to rein in as well. So I think it's more of a uh, sweating the spreadsheets, if I can call it that, rather than Highway 407 toll roads being sold off in a fire sale. The government also owns a, a good chunk of a car company still. Should they, should they sell those shares in GM yet? Yeah, they perfectly do intend to sell those shares, and obviously they'll be getting advice at the optimal time from their <laughs> broker, uh, much <laughs> like you would. I think the bigger issue for the government is that we have a fairly heavy infrastructure plan ahead. And at one point, there was discussion about whether we would put tolls on roads or on parking lots, and, and that seemed to have disappeared. And so you're left with the fallback then that we would borrow under the province of Ontario's name to fund a lot of that. The alternative is if we can sell some of these other assets, then effectively you're just redeploying their capital. You're saying, well, we used to own, say, a power distribution system, and we got revenue, a stream of revenues from that that we're giving up, but we also get a lump of cash by selling it that we can use in place of issuing more bonds around the world. So when we're in a period as we are now where we're doing a lot of borrowing around the world. The province of Ontario is, is going far and wide, every corner of the globe, to do its borrowing, to cover these deficits. Are people still happy to loan and us money? Absolutely. They are. Absolutely. We're still considered a pretty good credit, double A minus, for example, still a very high credit rating compared to a lot of other things people come by. So it's not really, we're not at the edge of our borrowing capacity, but it might be prudent to say, do we need to own all these other things or should we sell some of them to perhaps someone who can run them more effectively, get more money out of them, and deploy that money then in the, to cover the infrastructure financing that we want to do rather than borrow from that? And, and there is much talk of these so-called asset swaps. You'd swap out, in theory, the OPG and you'd be able to buy more um, infrastructure and, and transit construction. One thing to bear in mind is it's not just the Ed Clark show. The, the panel was constructed, the Blue Ribbon panel was constructed, very carefully calibrated to have you know, Janet Ecker, former Tory finance minister, Francis, uh, Francis Lankin, a, a powerful new Democrat uh, cabinet minister once. Mm -hmm. So it's as someone from the Canada, well, formerly from the Canada Pension CPP Investment Board. So there's a lot of diversity in that board in terms of financial experience and political. So I'm not expecting anything wild and crazy out of them. Uh, I'm just reminded, though, about the, the idea of toll roads and, and uh, parking fees and so on. Boy, those are taxes I would have gone forward with, but they weren't that popular. Those were user fees, not taxes, and the government decided not to do them anyway. Revenue tools. Revenue tools, that's right. That's the new buzzword. Uh, a couple of minutes left here. Let's finish on this. The government maintains it will balance the budget by 2017-18 fiscal year. Is that still possible? I think it's quite possible, but completely unpredictable. I, I, I don't have a lot of faith, as, as much as I, as I listen closely to the words, uh, in how these projections turn out, because not because the science is wrong, the econometrics, but there's weather involved, there's politics involved, there's upheaval, and who knows? Who can predict? We're in the long term, we're all dead. What I would say is it doesn't matter that much. I think it's important that they have more or less a plan, a target, that they're serious about it, and the credit rating agencies don't like them but don't see anything particularly wrong with it because they believe that in the end of the day, Ontario has the fiscal capacity to raise taxes if it needs to. Well, you so, give me the financial answer, I'll ask the bank or the political answer, <laughs> which is it, it matters in terms of that's when the next provincial election is going to happen, 2018. And if you haven't got, after promising for seven years, a balanced budget by 2017-18, you want to go back to polls that way? I think as long as the economy has performed reasonably well over that period, 
Uh, they will stick to the commitment to hit that target. And I think they'll get a bit of a pass if the economy has had a big bump in the road that prevents them. They say that close only counts in horseshoes, but actually close also counts here. If you get the budget deficit down to low single digits, for example, as a share of GDP, that's trivial. And for bond rating agencies or for buyers of those Ontario bonds, that will be good enough. And one little quick thing, the mm. unemployment rate, the conference board came out with its study saying that they're going to miss the deficit mark, but they said they'd come down from 7.1% now to 5.9% unemployment in 2017-18. I wouldn't mind going to the polls as a politician with unemployment below 6%. Below 6%. And it would be the first time in a very long time that yeah. that had happened. In your travels, are you finding anybody in the provincial cabinet or the backbenches of the Liberal government who's saying, boy, we made that promise for balanced budget by 1718, and I don't know how we're going to get there. Anybody saying that? No. No, and, I, and Charles Sousa, for what it's worth, is, is, is adamant that they're going to make that target. I think, they, I think they fully intend to do it. The Premier has stressed that privately, publicly. I think they intend to do it, but these things are unpredictable. Can't say for sure. You see what the numbers are today, though, and you wonder how they're going to get from, what did it end up, 10-5 to zero in not that many, I mean, it's not that far away anymore. You really do wonder how you're going to get there. Basically, nobody gets a pay increase working for the Ontario <laughs> government over that stretch. They maintain very tight-fisted spending plans, and probably they do go for some revenue somewhere uh, to help them out in the last couple of years. When you say go for some revenue somewhere, that sounds like increased taxes. Someone will pay more in taxes or fees, yeah. and um, and they'll they'll. I think in general, I don't think they'll have to do that much in that area that it will cost them politically. Avery Schenfeld, Martin Redcon, as always, great to have you on TVO tonight. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.